This is Dean Myers from VizWorld.com, and I'm here with Phil Simon, who is the author of The Visual Organization, and uh, today we are between two ferns. <laughs> and um, I thought it would be really interesting to talk to Phil on camera uh, about the book, uh, about himself, and about DataViz. My crib note says, uh, that I've listed Phil as he went from HR consulting to being a publishing entrepreneur and evangelist, but he's got better words for it than I do, so why don't I let you go ahead and explain who you are and what you're about and what you're doing and, and how you came to the sure. book. Well, thanks, Dean. Um, by way of background, I've written six books, and this one, I think, ties into the other books in a number of different ways, but I've always been around data going back to my days working in human resources eventually got out of HR into consulting, helping companies implement ERP and CRM systems. Uh, so I've always been around data and data viz. Uh, the previous book, actually going back to the fourth book, The Age of the Platform, I discuss how companies like Apple, Amazon, Facebook, and Google do amazing things. Um, in other words, they encourage innovation, they let people develop apps or books or services on top of, of their core products. As an offshoot of that, those companies generate a lot of information, and that became the fifth book, Too Big to Ignore, The Business Case for Big Data. Uh, after that book, I said to myself, there's so much more to say about big data. How do you actually make sense of it? And a blog post that I saw a couple weeks ago touched on the fact that uh, data visualization was kind of the front end of big data. Now, this isn't the first book, as you well know, and your listeners know, about data visualization, but in my um, experience, many of the books going back to when I was 19 years old at Carnegie Mellon, reading Tufte's book, Visual Display of Quantitative Information, focused more on the theory or how uh, one could visualize data, the best way to present data in a bi um, pie chart or bar chart or a heat map. Uh, to my knowledge, this is the first book that looks at what organizations are actually doing, particularly around what we now affectionately call big data. Um, but it isn't just about data viz, it's about a mindset, it's about understanding that the old tools worked well with small data, but perhaps we need new, more interactive tools to handle what we call big data. So that's uh, a very short description of how I got to this point. Well, I I'm really glad you, you, you spoke about the mindset because I think that's one of the most important things I pulled out of the book. Um, in my notes, I wrote uh, about the book and about data viz. That, well, I, I just want to talk also about the, the physical object. Are we, are we doing a good between two ferns thing here? You're... I don't think we're nearly being as funny as Zach Galifianakis. Oh, well. Nobody is. <laughs> but the point is, for me, um, that you produced a physical book. I know that there's an e-book version, correct? But, yes. but with, within the physical book, um, it's actually in, in full color, full page illustrations, um, I, which is absolutely terrific. Yeah, I, think I felt very really strongly valuable. that this book needed to be of a certain size, a certain quality, obviously color versus black and white. Um, I had seen other books that were kind of crammed in in black and white about data mm. visualization. I felt like they didn't do the data or the data viz justice. So it's not easy to write a book that sells a decent number of copies and no one will be mistaking me for Malcolm Gladwell anytime soon. But I thought by doing the book in this way, we maximized the chance that it had the impact that I think it could. Great. Uh, just by the by, are there also because within the book there is a lot of discussion about interactivity. Yes. Are, are there references to for people to go and look at interactive things that will be referenced back in the book or is yes. that something you want to do? Or? Uh, it's not comprehensive because the web as you know changes very oh gosh, quickly. Of course. Um, but I did over the course of my research for the book come across a, a very a significant number of useful and in many cases open source or low cost tools. Uh, certainly with software as a service in the cloud, it's a lot more affordable to deploy best of breed solutions. This is in 1998 when companies spent millions of dollars on an enterprise wide BI initiative. Uh, but in my six books, this is my first appendix, and that appendix is devoted to tools like uh, Many Eyes or D3 or Tableau, some of the tools out there that organizations are using to turn the um, mess of big data into something that actually makes sense, defined, as they say, uh, the signal and the noise. Right, and, and there's open source stuff. You talk about open source, and there are freemium models where people can go and play for a trial period or have limited resources, and then if they want to go do the deep dive, they, they can at various levels. So, so there's a lot of useful things. But going back to something where we talked about the mindset, where you spoke about the mindset, and I said I wanted to refer to that. So my first question is, when you talk to the C-suite, what's, what's their fear, and how can they get to be a visual 
organization, and I, I hate the term C-suite, but you know, I'm wearing right. Brooks Brothers, so I gotta say <laughs> that word. So. Well, Dean, I would say that many organizations are really conservative and very hidebound. If you're a 55-year-old CIO and your organization failed 10 years ago implementing a BI product or ERP or CRM, and that was well understood, what are your odds of spending millions of dollars on Hadoop or a best-of-breed data viz tool and turning that into insight? So, as you know, many organizations don't want to be early adopters. Right. Many are in sort of the, the middle majority or the laggard phase. Uh, for every Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Google, and Netflix, companies that do big data exceptionally well, I would argue that thousands more don't. Uh, I do think it's fear of the unknown, feel of failure, feel of risk. Uh, the fact that you can't, in my opinion, um, tie a specific ROI to this stuff. Um, Very good if you're point, looking yeah. at ERP, you might say, well, we spend $200,000 doing it manually. If we spend a million dollars and we only spend 100,000, then over 10 years it pays for itself. With big data and data viz, I just don't think that you can make that case. Who knows what you're going to find? Many organizations, I think, to answer your question, focus far too much on the costs of action and not nearly enough on the costs of inaction. Uh, they look at companies, for example, like Netflix, and they're intimidated. They don't understand, however, that 15 years ago, Netflix couldn't do one-tenth of what it can do today. Uh, it's, this is not an IT project, and I think that's a very difficult thing for many people to get their arms around. Uh, IT, in many organizations, still controls the data, and many line people complain about that, but if you remove IT from the equation and then they have access to the data and they're not making decisions based on it, then you really can't blame IT. So I, I do think that it's more of a cultural or organizational issue uh, than it is a technology issue. The tools are out there, the only question to me is, are organizations willing to embrace them? And that's one of the reasons that I wrote the book. Yeah. I, I think one of the um, one of the hidden conversations that you, you don't necessarily bring to light, but you talk around it and you use some of the terminology is, is you know this fascination with being agile, being lean. You know these are these are new buzzwords about um, approach to innovation and development. And and I, I get this very strong undercurrent that you're you're advocating that you talk about in the book. You talk about the ambiguity or the fact that uh, that you don't get it right the first time. That there's it, it's an iterative process. Yes. And I think that's what you're alluding to is that it's not, uh, we're going to pull up a spreadsheet and we have what looks like something firm and complete because it's a bunch of numbers stuck in, in these boxes that there's, you know, when you can take a data visualization and twist and turn it and, mm -hmm. and keep asking what if over and over and over again, I think that ambiguity is what you're getting at. Is sure, and there's a reason the subtitle contains the phrase, the quest for better decisions. I, I believe, Dean, as, as you probably do as well, that we no longer live in this era of set and forget it. Uh, for instance, about seven, eight years ago, I went to a company in New Jersey to do some consulting and build a simple ETL tool, extract the data from one part of the system, transform it and load it into another part. And when I came back six, seven years ago, um, I should say three or four years ago to do an upgrade, they used the same tool. And I asked the woman, have you tweaked it? Does it still work? No, I haven't tweaked it because it still works. That's fine, I'm glad I did my job as a consultant, but in this era of big data when new data sources are streaming at us faster than ever, can we truthfully say that we are capturing everything we need to capture when we're ignoring new data sources? Uh, when three, four years ago, companies started to get their arms around social data sources like Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter, and all of a sudden Pinterest sprouted up, many organizations said, oh gosh, there's another one? Well, in point of fact, yes. Um, you may have to deal with Pinterest because its engagement numbers are very strong. The point is that um, we do have to be comfortable with ambiguity. As I like to say, we have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. And I think that um, uncomfortability, that lack of a set process, that, la that uh, knowledge that what worked before may not work now or may not work in the future uh, makes, very pe makes quite a few people uncomfortable. And as a result, they cling to uh, traditional tools like KPIs and standard reports, and don't get me wrong, just because of big data, a P&L doesn't lose its importance. If you work in payroll, a payroll register still matters. But my question is, do those tools explain the whole story, or even the most, in part, uh, most important part of the story? And as I researched the book, I found that many organizations were willing to throw data out there to uh, investigate new data sources, to deploy new tools, and see where it would take them without necessarily knowing like in the case of Netflix, where it would take them. But there was this core belief that data matters and they would figure out a use for it. And if they didn't, oh well, they still learned something. I think what you're alluding to is um, the hidden fear. There's real disruption in what leadership is when it comes down to it, especially, you know, the bigger the, bigger the company, the, the, more, um, the more it feels like the disruption will be massive. Mm -hmm. um, because sure. the, whole, the whole underpinning of the top-down structure and, and all of that is, is shifting. So. 
Yes, I mean, the innovator's dilemma, I would argue, is alive and well. Why did Mark Zuckerberg just drop $19 billion for WhatsApp when Facebook is, by all accounts, a healthy company? Um, I give credit to the companies that may pay ungodly amounts of money for companies that I don't think are necessarily worth it, but they're willing to experiment, they're willing to fail. I think that it's silly, regardless of whether you're in telecom or cable, to assume that the world today will remain the same in 5, 10, 15 years. There's someone in a garage right now looking to disrupt every company. You know, why is Google spending a lot of money on Android and Glass? Well, because they understand at the highest levels that people won't necessarily search over the computer and find words through um, Google keywords. That could change, and Google wants to be prepared for it. That's why they're spending a lot of money on Nest, over $3 billion. That's why they're developing driver, driverless cars and other secret things in Project X. So to me, this is more of a management book than a technology one, and certainly more so than a pure data viz book like ones from Tufty and Stephen right. Few. Sure. Uh, one of the things also that's a, um, that I hear is a sub, uh, subtext, and it ties to both, we'll say, the uh, management leadership, uh, organizational side of things, but also the technology side of things, is this idea of um, it's now so big and so broad that it's a col it takes a collaborative effort yes. to, to create, I'll call it the product, but um, why don't you elaborate on that a little Absolutely. Bit? I think that roles are becoming very blurry. In fact, um, one of the sexiest new uh, job titles out there is data scientist, which to me is sort of a, a hybrid <laughs> yeah. of a designer and a statistician and a technologist and a business person and a bunch of other things, even a data model are thrown in. Um, I do think that there's a real danger in having someone in IT design a tool mm. for six months a year and then it's theoretically finished and then it gets rolled out to the line and they look at it and go, I don't understand how to use this. Well, that's not very agile, that's very sort of waterfall oriented. Yes. And as I wrote about in my first book, Why New Systems Fail, the vast majority of waterfall projects fail for all sorts of reasons, not the least of which is that there isn't that interactivity, there isn't that uh, testing, there isn't that feedback. And that is very much based on this agile notion, or to, to quote Eric Ries from the Lean Startup, right. this, this notion of a minimal uh, viable product. The MVP, sure. Right, um, I do think that those types of concepts are inherent in these visual organizations. Just as an example, uh, when I was researching the book, I came across a guy by the name of Justin Macheka from Autodesk who created something called the organic org chart, or org, org chart, which is in the book. And he used tools like processing and Python. Yeah. And it's a fantastic interactive tool. And when I talked to him about it, I said, talk to me about your development process. You did not just sit down and then six months later it was finished. It's absolutely not. I was dealing with line people. I was asking for their feedback and it wasn't a linear process. Sometimes he would blow things up so he'd take a step back to take two steps forward. Uh, again, that sort of contravenes a lot of people's conception of work. You're supposed to work in a very regimented step-like manner. Well, that to me is incongruous with this notion of data discovery. Um, you're leading perfectly to this, uh, my last question in my notes here is so how can a statistician or a data scientist, but I like the idea of how can a statistician become a storyteller? Sure. Because um, that's also implied, uh, and there are moments where you talk about pulling the stories out of, uh, out of the data visualization to, to make it a much larger thing than just a, 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 pretty, a pretty image or a piece of art. Right. I'd say, Dean, that first up, it's important to recognize your audience. Um, it's great to have done the work, to know the, stat the statistics and the theory behind it, but recognize that most people are not proper statisticians. Most people will, quite frankly, be intimidated or lost or just tune out if they hear things like type 1 or type 2 error or normal distribution. Learn from someone like Nate Silver, who is absolutely a statistician, but he writes well. Learn from someone like Malcolm Gladwell. I would argue that Gladwell's science, like, like many people I believe, is flawed. He sort of cherry picks his stories to support his theory. That doesn't mean that it's universally applicable. However, few people can argue that he weaves a good yarn. Mm -hmm. The man knows how to tell a good story. Now, it's great to have the detail behind it, but recognize that most people really are interested in the story and what it means for them and what they can do. And if they ask you why should you do something totally different, then it's great to have the numbers behind it in case they're curious. But I found early in my career that if I led with the numbers, that was uh, sort of perilous. One of my favorite stories as a consultant occurred when, when I was at that same company in New Jersey and I had to develop that tool that I mentioned before. This is a, a great uh, way to bookend it. And I was with a very tech-phobic HR person and I was with the DBA, the database administrator, so very different audiences, and I had to explain what my tool did. I realized that I could not have that conversation at the same time to those two people. 
I told the HR person, um, give me a few minutes, why don't you get a cup of coffee? And I sat down with the DBA and I walked through at a very technical level which table and when it would run and what it would populate and the kind of backup procedure. It's a very technical discussion. He walked out going, perfect, I got it. And the woman comes back from HR and says, can you tell me what the tool does? And I said, at a high level, it moves data around. If you'd like to know more, I'd be happy to tell you. And she said, no, 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 this is perfect. So recognize that you may have to tell two different stories to two different types of audiences. And if you know your audience, um, that's probably going to help you. A tool that's too technical for a functional user or too functional for a technical user is unlikely to be, uh, I think, very successful. But yes, stories absolutely matter. That hasn't changed in, was it P.T. Barnum knew that a long time ago, right? <laughs> absolutely. Great. Um, any parting thoughts on, um, uh, I always like to ask, uh, what's your passion project or uh, next steps, but um, I'll ask it in a sideways thing. Um, what's the next step the person picks up and reads the book and, um, well, again, I've pulled out two kinds of people. You have the, we'll, we'll call it the C-suite or the leadership type of person or, conversely, the statistician, data scientists, next steps for, for right. them after reading the book. One of my favorite quotes is from The Simpsons, and when Bart is running for president against um, Martin, uh, Mart, uh, <laughs> Bart says, my opponent says there are no easy answers. I say he's not looking hard enough. Um, there really are no easy answers. The goal of this book was to prompt a series of questions. Do we have the right tools? Do we have the right people? Uh, do we have the culture that encourages people to discover new things from data? Are we holding people accountable for that? Um, if that's the case, then maybe you don't need the logic in the book, but odds are organizations aren't doing as much as they can with data. As I said, when you read the case study on Netflix, you might go, my gosh, they're quantifying the colors on movie jackets. That's amazing to me. We don't even know how many employees work here or who our customers are. That process takes two or three weeks to find out. So hopefully at the C-suite, they're asking questions, and those questions will really permeate the organization. Uh, again, this is not a how-to guide. There's no top 10 list or checklist of ways to become a visual organization. In fact, as I note in the book, this notion of a visual organization isn't even a binary. I treat it that way early on before in chapter six, I believe, introduce a um, framework mm -hmm. of levels. In other words, if you're a company like Wedgies that does a decent amount with, with smaller amounts of data than your level one or level two, Netflix, because they do so much with interactive data viz on unstructured data, is really a level four. So ask yourself, and there's an entire chapter devoted in the book on questions for how you can move up the levels. Again, going from level two to level three or level four doesn't guarantee anything but uh, as I quote in the book George E.P. Box all essentially all models are useful sorry essentially all models are wrong but some are useful hopefully it's a useful model for people to ask some of the questions to really start to turn some of this data into insights okay. thanks for your time again uh, the book is the visual organization and uh, Phil Simon has talked about it and uh, hopefully you'll find it interesting to uh, to read and to find inspiration out of it Thank you, Dean. Thanks a lot.